What is Spain going to look like after this coronavirus pandemic? What aspects of this country that we know and love are going to change potentially forever? That's the question that we're answering today. So venga, let's go. Hey Spain lovers, Yoli and I were sipping sangria from last week's video and we started wondering what is going to change because of this coronavirus pandemic? You know, what are we at risk of losing and what might some of the positive changes be? So we've come up with a list of seven aspects of life in Spain that may change dramatically with coronavirus. Everything from tapas and social interactions to football, flamenco or bullfighting. And so they're saying that there might be tourism allowed in Spain by the end of June. So if you live here or if you're thinking of visiting, you know, this is directly going to impact on you some of these potential changes. And hang till the end because I think the last one that we deal with might surprise you. All right, should we kick off? Yeah. We're counting down from seven to one. And number seven is, will Spaniards lose their love of close contact, close physical contact? And I think the first thing that comes to my mind, Yoli, is los besos. Los besos. Kissing. We can't do that right now. That's <laughs> breaching the, the physical safety distance. Are we going to stop doing it completely? You know, when we feel like it's it's okay to do it again in the future, will we have lost the habit of doing that? I actually love the vessels. What I love about it is when you go and see some friends, you will go around and kiss kind of so many people and it takes so much time. <laughs> when you arrive at a group of people in New Zealand, you're like, hey everyone. But in this place, you go around, you kiss everyone. And I just love that ritual. So I hope we don't lose that. Right? Another thing that we could lose is our physical space that you know we don't really respect in Spain so much yeah. we have very little physical space I so love that. very soon if you meet someone new you're gonna be touching their arm while mm, you're talking to them true. or maybe I do I don't know no totally it's very touchy-feely kind yeah. of culture and I read once this great quote that Spaniards love the intimacy of a crowd uh -huh. you know even if you're not touching just being physically near someone is something that you guys love yeah so will we lose that habit will it become somehow taboo I don't yeah. know what do you guys think let us know and this first one really Really touches on a lot of these things that we're going to deal with in this video. Obviously, we can't do certain things right now. So will our natural Spanish, speaking as a Spaniard, instinct return after yeah. this? And I actually sent a message to the members of this YouTube channel to get their take on uh -huh. these different changes. And I want to read a few out to you. I want to start with one. Miss Gina said, the inherent nature of the Spanish people to be open, welcoming, and festive won't truly be affected by this. In time, the natural tendency for life's enjoyment will return, and it might even produce more appreciation for having it. I feel optimistic that people will appreciate human connection even more than before. So Ms. Gina is taking a more positive uh, you know, slant on what this could look like. And I think for all of these, it just could go in so many different ways. Let's move on to number six. Will Spain's eating culture change? Now, we're going to deal with tapas specifically later. But broadly speaking, this is a country where we share so much food. You know, we don't necessarily always have our individual plate. We're yeah. reaching, we're, we're, we're scraping out of the same bowl, uh, which sounds a bit weird but you know what I mean. So, you know, a couple of examples. When we eat paella, and recently we had a paella here, we actually made a video about it. When you eat paella, traditionally, you don't serve everybody's individual plate. You actually all eat out of the big uh, paella pan. Yeah. And so you're all kind of in there with your spoons. And one of my greatest memories of eating paella is actually at a restaurant in Barcelona, and we got the wooden spoons and we we're all eating, and, and you're scraping the socarrat, which is the, the crusty bits on the bottom. Now, are we gonna be able to do that still? The other thing about sharing food is like, I have great memories of eating it at your parents' house, where you know I kind of discovered the idea of shared eating, where Yoli's mother would put a bunch of different plates on the table and we'd all be reaching, and would actually, for the salad, yeah. it always shocked mm. me and surprised me, and I kind of love it, is you wouldn't put individual pieces of salad on people's plate. You have one salad bowl in the middle and everyone forks into the salad yeah. bowl. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, I love this stuff. Yeah, well, I'm about to you know figure that out because I will be, I guess, having lunch with my parents next Next week at last. Am I invited? So I guess so. <laughs> I'm thinking um, long lunches mm. uh, we're used to and that sobremesa, that little get together after lunch, yeah. you know, like, you know, maybe having cocktails and things like that yeah. after lunch. That might get a little bit shortened because I reckon people are not going to be so willing to just spend time just there hanging out, yeah. you know, especially when you can't really be as close to people as you used to. Certainly well. no no sobremesas maybe in the short term. Will it come back in the long term? Who knows? How strong are these cultural yeah, kind of pretty strong. So things, I would say, yeah, know? I mean, of course, the longer this lasts for, the worse for the tradition. But I think totally. that, you know, if it's like a couple of years, think it'll sustain. Yeah. There's also some things that might come back and I had a great idea. It could be the return of the porron. 
This is a poron. <laughs> this is a drinking vessel that Yoli's father showed me showed me how to drink from it back in the day when people. Sorry, I'm putting it in front of Yoli's face. Back in the day when people didn't have individual wine glasses, you just shared from from this receptacle, receptacle, and so you would all you would just drink from it and pass it around, but your lips never touch it. There's actually water in here because we ran out of white wine, and I don't want to use red wine to stain all my shirt. And so it's the morning too. And it's the morning as well. So <laughs> I, that's not a reason. You know, we're in Spain, baby. <laughs> that's a tradition that won't change. Day drinking. <laughs> Yoli's turn. Let's see. It's been a long time. They always say that. Yoli! Woo! The porron is coming back, people. <laughs> Number five, will Spain's tapas culture change? Now, this is one that's really close to my heart, and I'm gonna start off with reading a message that channel member Robert said. I fear that the excitement of crowded tapas bars we have experienced will not be available moving forward. Places like Casa Tony, shout out to Casa Tony, with only a few people will just not be the same. And I really empathize with Robert's thought there. The, the beauty for me of tapas is not really just the food, it's the physical experience of these really heaving, <laughs> places, so many people, you're brushing up against people, yeah. and not just because I like brushing up against people, <laughs> but we you know we're like that. Exa right? Exactly. Uh, I'm not going to cut that, guys. That's, you know, we'll leave that in. Really, because what I love is I love the random encounters that you have because yeah. of that physical proximity and yeah. the energy that a tapas bar room has. So if everyone's at their individual tables and you've got Plexi's glass, you know, the, you lose that kind of that. Like that. every night is a huge party because you're like surrounded exactly. by so many people. And exactly. You can more or less interact with everyone. And tapas, for those, you know, who are big fans of the channel, know I've talked about tapas as a verb, to tapear. Mm. And so how can you tapear? How can you do the act of tapas if it's kind of quiet and you're all sitting at a table and things like that? What else, Yoli? Well, there's been some guidelines actually uh, published by the mm. government and I'll read them to you and see uh, what your reaction is yeah, to Yeah, these are recommendations to tapas bars to about bars, as yeah. we move into phase one where they're allowed to open somewhat. And if you're curious about the phases, I've got a, a video I made about that, I'll link above. But as we move into phase one, these are guidelines that tapas bars have to follow or restaurants yeah. have to follow to make sure that they are being safe. First one is uh, sanitizing the tables and chairs and changing tablecloth between each customer. Okay, I guess that's gonna slow down the experience. You know, tapas is all about speed and randomness, so if it's all very kind of measured like that, that could impact on the experience of and tapas, the rhythm, or right? the, the rhythm of it. Pay with credit card, and you have to clean the machine every single time. A lot of tapas bars, although less and less, uh, only accept cash, so I don't see this as a big one in a way. So, you know, if we move to paying by card, most, most places, even traditional places in Madrid, you can pay by card these yeah. days. So, again, it's gonna slow down the experience a little bit. It might impact on the tipping yes that's a big one yeah. so there might be less tipping which is True. obviously important could be one there uh, uh, that could impact on the, the yeah. earnings of the small tapas it might be good for economy because less hidden economy less dodgy kind of like you can only pay in cash here and it's uh -huh. like what is that yeah, you know yeah, things yeah. like that don't use communal menus that's an interesting one individual menus that's an extra cost for an, a traditional tapas bar obviously and these are all costs particularly when they can have less people in them how can they survive having said that a lot of really traditional tapas bars don't actually have a menu or the menus are on the wall so it may yeah. not be a dramatic change. Last but not least, and one of my favorite, mm. <laughs> bathrooms need to be washed uh. at least six times a day. Booyah! So, <laughs> Love any, that. <laughs> anybody who has gone to a super traditional tapas bar in Spain may have had the experience of like, have they ever cleaned this bathroom? <laughs> so now they have to clean it minimum six times a day. That's going to be a massive culture shift and not a negative one if you ask me, right? Maybe if that tradition hangs on after the fact, then you know, that mind. might be good. Well, one thing I did think about was pinchos. So the pincho culture in northern Spain and, and San Sebastian, often the pinchos are all on display and you just take the pincho that you want. So now in San Sebastian, the city council has said that all those pinchos on the bar have to be covered right. with you know plastic or glass or whatever. Yeah. I don't think that's going to return to previous times. I feel like once you cover Probably them, not. it's hard to yeah. uncover them. I love seeing a pincho bar just covered in pinchos and the idea you can grab things. I think that's kind of wonderful. So I'm a little bit sad to lose that. It also means that means you have to ask the waiter to, to give, give it, it to you. You, you know, and that again, slows things down, it kind of, you lose a little bit of the tradition there, a little bit of the culture. One thing I will say though, is as big followers of this channel might know, often in a pincho bar, the best pinchos are the ones you order from the kitchen. They're not the ones on they're display. in the moment, right? Exactly, they're cooked in the moment. So I never really actually grab the ones on the bar anyway, there so go. there you go, no biggie. <laughs> what do you guys think about the impact on the tapas culture? What do you think is gonna change? Let us know in the comments below. Moving along to number four, which is flamenco. Will flamenco change? 
Now, I'm gonna read a comment here by channel member Rob who says, I'm thinking about the flamenco tablaos and social distancing. A tablao is a place where you see flamenco. And he comments on how many of these venues are really small and cramped. Now, I'm gonna hand this over to Yoli to talk about flamenco. Thank you but before much. I do, some of you might be wondering, what is this channel memberships thing? So this is a way for big fans of this channel to support our ability to make videos. And in return, we make behind the scenes content for you. If you're curious, there's more info below. All right, Yoli. Coronavirus and flamenco, what's right. gonna happen? Flamenco is an art form that is about sweat and tears and blood <laughs> and, and really physical, yeah. you know. So the stage often is so small. I mean just a few square meters. In there you cram up to Whoa, seven people sometimes. Yeah. So it's three or four dancers. I mean, uh, you know, no big in terms of the dancing because usually they do dance by themselves, mm. not, you know, in couples. Then you also have singers, one, two, three singers mm. sometimes, guitarists. Small, so it's almost um, like dangerous stages. for the artists and then for the audience. And then for the audience, because I mean, what happens when you... Well, when you go to a flamenco <laughs> venue, if you're sitting in the front row, that's like that's like ground zero in a flamenco <laughs> performance, because when they spin around, often the sweat flies off. It's going to be hard for these places to open up and run again. Yeah, I, I guess they'll have to separate the tables, you know, the first line. You Plexiglass know? around the stage to yeah, catch the sweat, maybe. Also, yeah, and also the tables from each other, because usually they do cram the tables you yeah. know, a little bit. And then also in terms of uh, dance academies. Mm. So where I dance in Casapatas by phase two of the unlocking down of this <laughs> situation uh, they're gonna start they're gonna resume classes and uh, they were just talking about the measures they're gonna take so that's about controlling uh, how many people are gonna be taking classes no mm. more than eight people per which class. makes it harder for the school to make money exactly also they're gonna have ozone um, dispensers uh, ozone generators I don't oh really God. know how I don't even that know what helps. those are but those sound expensive <laughs> but you always need to look on the right side right and Yoli's good at that <laughs> so I reckon that uh, it might impact flamenco in a really positive way that flamenco lately was all about footwork. Mm. It had become very much about just very fast and, and a lot of cardio exercise, mm. which is not great when you have to be wearing a mask, maybe mm. uh, dancing. So now flamenco might just shift the focus and maybe go a little bit more about upper body beautiful gorgeous moves that mm. don't require so much cardio exercise and so much sweating so yeah. much sweating yeah. and yeah so less physical number three will spanish football change now those of you who know this channel well know that i don't know much about spanish football don't I, I, I don't, i'm not a true spaniard i don't follow <laughs> it so i had to reach out to my my spanish football gurus on this one dermot corrigan and phil k they told me that games are planning to start around mid-june but the games will be behind closed doors and there'll be no fans in the stadiums until at least January at the earliest, which has a big impact on kind of what football means in Spain generally. It's a real crowd experience. Yeah. So Dermot gave this image of empty stadiums, coaches and managers on the sidelines in masks. And right. Phil said football- And the players, like they don't get the cheering from the public. Yeah, right? that's from true. The they don't get the feedback. Phil also said football in an empty stadium is <laughs> And so, you know, there you go. <laughs> Phil also said that, you know, when fans are allowed back, what are the rituals that will change? What about the idea of, of meeting in a bar, you know, Again, that tapas, mm. that tapas bar thing before the, the game and, and crowding in and having a few drinks, will that still happen or will people go directly to the stadium? And the idea at half time of going and you know buying a sandwich or buying some food, will that change? Which is interesting because the tradition really for football historically is to bring your own bocadillo or bring yeah. your own sandwich. So maybe if they can't sell food at the games, people will re return to that older tradition. So mm -hmm. there could be kind of like a, a, positive, a positive there yeah. in a sense. Always a positive. Dermot also said that La Liga's tech people are working on new interactive features to improve the fan experience from home. He wasn't sure what these are yet, but he said traditionalists are not happy, while younger fans in the US, Middle East, China will probably enjoy this more. So yeah. they're kind of working on ways to, to obviously people can watch these games, you know, from afar online and maybe they can answer polls. 3D or glasses and they're 3D like playing maybe they're, Yeah, God, you should get hired by La Liga, Yoli. <laughs> That'll solve our problems. The other thing that Phil said is the Spanish football employs 180,000 people in Spain and is 1.5% of the GDP. So it's just massive. Dermot also commented that the clubs will have smaller budgets right. and this might mean that simply they can't get the big players right. you know so we might they can't find that pay there's so much, yeah, yeah the, Spain might not have the big players mm -hmm. uh, for a few years too will this be the end of bullfighting 
Thank you for that, Yoli. <laughs> so I read an article in The Guardian the other day by Ashifa Kassam, a journalist who reports on Spain, and she wrote an article about how coronavirus and how lockdown is affecting bullfighting. Now, obviously, this is a controversial topic, especially on this channel, because those of you who know me and Yoli know that we are not fans and not pro bullfighting. But obviously, it's, it's an industry here in Spain that supports a lot of families. So when it's just cut off like that, it has a massive impact on a lot of people. What's interesting is a little like tourism, the bullfighting season was just about to kick off. So right. we were having San Isidro, which mm -hmm. is the, the festival here in Madrid. Uh, of May. So when, when the bullfighting season starts and runs through to October, so it really cut it off just as this industry was about to receive uh, a lot of money. It's not even going to save the bulls. Apparently a lot of breeders or some breeders have already slaughtered their bulls because they what? know they won't. Yeah, probably wanted to sell them for meat or something like that. I mean, bullfighting was already on the way in from the last economic downturn. Yeah. It, it had really hit it hard. Uh, and also the morals of people are changing. Young people are not so into it. Yeah. So, you know, bullfighting was sort of on its way out and this will be the ultima estocada. There's also another way of thinking about this, that sometimes when big dramatic things like this happen and, and particularly that if, if the globe becomes smaller or people become more about you know, connecting with their local identity because mm. they're not traveling as much, maybe it actually leads to a resurgence around bullfighting. Oh, well, there you go. Sometimes these things have very unexpected consequences, but who knows for the future? Really curious to see your thoughts on this one down below. Let us know. Now we've come to number one of the seven ways that coronavirus might change Spain. And this one might seem a little unexpected. Could coronavirus solve the problem in parts of Spain of over tourism. It's, it's a very complex one, but this is a country where Barcelona has you know, long been in the, in the press for over tourism, too many people in what is really effectively a small city. Seville was starting to have challenges with over tourism, Madrid as well in the last few years, because Spain is just such a wonderful place. So many people want to come they here. Come. Now that we can't travel, what does it mean for these destinations, you know, and for the country as a whole? So it might be nature's way of telling us to slow down and to not sort of pile so many people into one place, for example. <laughs> which could yeah. have a beneficial impact in some ways mm -hmm. uh, on the destinations. On the other hand, 12% of Spain's GDP is from tourism. Yeah. So that is a massive economic and impact. And 100% of this household. And 100% of this household is on tourism. So that's a massive economic impact. So you've got these really complex issues where it might give Barcelona a chance for residents to kind of reclaim their city yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And on the other hand, people in Barcelona may lose their jobs mm -hmm. because there's less tourism. One interesting thing is actually at Devour Tours, we're starting to do a lot of virtual experiences, online cooking classes that you can connect with a guide in Barcelona and learn how to make tapas with Enrique or, or paella with Arancha in Madrid. They're there, but you're connecting, so you're not visiting. Will there be a rise in virtual tourism? Yeah, I don't totally, know. Yeah. A lot of different ways this could go. What do you think, Yoli? For sure, it's gonna help these destinations for a little while in terms of like, catching its breath, but you know, it might be like for four or five years, something like that. But I think, I mean, people love to travel. People love to like, be there and mm. step on, you know, Roman stones and yeah. all of these, you know. Don't so, step on the Roman stones, that's important. <laughs> <laughs> I think tourism will be back. What we don't know though is that, you know, it's trends. So Barcelona was very trendy. Maybe yeah. in five years, it won't be so trendy. It might be another country that has become trendy throughout these years. And it might um, be a country that has a different culture around physical space or mm -hmm. it might be more nature tourism is yeah. another shift. So there might be yeah. a shift to nature tourism in Spain. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of things that could happen here. Really curious to know what you guys think. Let us know in the comments below about this over tourism kind of conundrum. Guys, if you're curious about what's happening in Spain with the coronavirus situation right now, click the playlist that's appearing somewhere over this side of the screen near Holly's face. We've made a bunch of videos telling you about what's going on and that will bring you up to date. So we'll see you over there in a moment. Ciao. Ciao.